Welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional. Today, we're brought to you by Time to Pet and the National Association of Professional Pet Sitters. Today, we are tackling a topic that a lot of us fear on a daily basis in running our businesses of dog walking and pet sitting, and that's of, an, of, of a pet escaping while we are caring for them. And so to, to tackle this and give us some great advice, we have Annalisa Burns, the pet detective from Pet Search and Rescue on, to talk about not just how we can prevent it, but what do we do in the unfortunate case where they do get out and how can we help educate our pet parents. So Annalisa, thank you so much for coming and, and, ta- and talking about this topic. I know you're super passionate about it. Please tell us a little bit more about who you are and all that you do. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a real life pet detective, just like Ace Ventura, but a little bit different. I actually specialize in lost animal behavior and I use trained search dogs to help search for lost pets. I got into this almost 20 years ago now, and I've devoted my life to helping lost pets and educating people on how to prevent their pets from going missing in the first place. Oh, now, what, what got you started in this and so passionate about it? Well, I had a dog with major separation anxiety, and she actually got me into this line of work. I had adopted her from the San Diego Humane Society. Shout out to an amazing animal control shelter in Southern California. I had adopted this wonderful puppy, and the first day I tried to go to work, she literally turned into the Tasmanian devil and tore apart the condo, the door frame, my favorite shoes, everything. So I hired um, an animal behaviorist, and I did a consultation, and they suggested that she had low self-esteem and needed a job to build her confidence, and they were right. So I was trying to find different things to do with her. Um, She was my soulmate dog, Lily, a German short hair pointer mix. Uh, Again, a shelter dog. I think they're the best. And um, so I was looking for things to do. I tried agility. I even tried human search and rescue, which didn't go so well. And. (laughs) Yeah. So I finally saw it on TV. Media is amazing because it really can provide us with all of these different ideas and information that we wouldn't know of otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I found about this person, Kat Albrecht. She was an ex-police officer who had the great idea to use search dogs to find lost pets. And I took my training with her. And the first dog I found, I helped recover. And the first cat I searched for, uh, I helped with closure and I was hooked. Well, I know it's it's definitely one that is, is high emotion, right? It's one that we have to kind of be mentally prepared for as well to tackle this because there's just a lot of stuff that we have to do. And earlier you said a phrase about lost pet behavior. I think many of us are are familiar with pet behavior and what they are trying to communicate us through body language and sounds. How is lost pet behavior different than what we may be experiencing in a home? That's a great question, actually. So when we have a pet in its normal environment, under normal circumstances, we kind of have an idea how it will behave. So, you know, if somebody rings your front doorbell, your dog probably will go bark at the front door, or if your dog isn't into that, we'll keep taking a nap, whatever. You have an idea of how your pet will behave in under normal circumstances. Now, when a pet goes missing, it is not normal circumstances. So we have to throw that out the window. Now, it can give us insight into how the animal will behave, but nothing really gives us 100% clarity on what will happen with the animal because the biggest unknown factor is the external factors. So does somebody honk their horn at the dog that's trying to cross the street or chase a shy dog, those sorts of things. So animal behavior in its normal environment gives us insight into how they might behave when missing but it's not a hundred percent guarantee because of the unknown external factors. 
So, for example, when a pet goes missing, they're probably overall going to be more shy, more skittish, more cautious than they would be with you at home because they're outside in an unknown environment, maybe hiding, maybe scared. So you can have an insight, but you can't predict it because of those reasons. Yeah, and we we think a lot about stress stacking for pets when they're in the home of like, okay, did the doorbell get rung? Is it trash day? Is there a squeaky fan on the ceiling that's been going for the last six hours? And then we walk in and the dog is you know, on, on edge or acting a little bit differently. How much more so when they're out in a completely uncontrolled environment? And we have they're, they're, the, the possibilities there are, are totally endless of what they're experiencing one after another in a rapid succession. And I've seen this many times in person where the animal gets out. I have a case example for you about this specifically. A dog that would hang out in the front yard in a neighborhood in San Diego, California, never had really much of an issue with it. The pet owner would be gardening and things like that. Well, one time the owner went inside for a brief moment. And some kids came by on bicycles. Well, maybe that's like not really a trigger normally, but maybe a little bit of stacking is going on there. And then one of the kids starts throwing rocks at the dog. So then that brings the animal up really high in an emergency response. Even though the dog doesn't want to leave home, has never wandered off because of that situation, then the dog has to. Well, guess what is two blocks away where the dog runs to major busy intersections. So then the dog now is beyond its threshold and is trying to run across a busy intersection with almost getting hit and horns honking from the cars, people yelling, people trying to intervene, that sort of thing. So this is absolutely a factor. And the same thing with cats. Uh, I did want to kind of talk about common ways that dogs escape. I know, again, the, the so many different factors, but from your experience, what are some common themes that you see with dogs that end up escaping or, or getting out of where they're supposed to be? Well, a lot has to do with noise and holidays, Mm. 4th of July fireworks, New Year's Eve fireworks, those sorts of things, gunfire. That's a major contributing factor to dogs going missing. We know that the busiest times of year for lost dogs are going to be around those points. Also, pet owners taking their pets on vacation, going places where the pet doesn't know where it is, and newly adopted, rescued Uh, pets are going to be at a higher risk of going missing because they aren't really comfortable and bonded with their uh, pet owner. How are those different or the same with with cats? Because I know we're not just talking about dogs here. We all take care of cats as well. Right. Uh, A lot less cats go missing due to fireworks. That's a very uncommon thing for people to report. Mm. Cats are much more likely, it depends if they're indoor only or outdoor access. Let me comment that. So outside access, if a kitty cat's outside, they get into trouble. So (laughs) that could be anything from getting stuck in the neighbor's garage to having an altercation with another outside cat. They definitely that they get into trouble. Indoor only cats that accidentally get outside or how they go missing because they are totally unaware of the uh, territory. That being said, both cats and dogs are at a much higher likelihood of going missing before, during and after a move. You know, you mentioned holidays, people traveling, moves. Those are actually really common reasons why people hire pet sitters because they are traveling. And so when you're like, oh, yeah, this is the most time pets go missing. Well, this is also the busiest time for a pet sitter. So when you when you think of over holidays, especially noise related holidays, what are some things that we as pet sitters could be doing to help limit or reduce that kind of thing when when we are in there taking care of them? Exactly. You're spot on with this question. I think one of the most important things is the onboarding with the client 
especially when we find out why they are wanting the pet sitter and around these seasonal times, times when there's noises, it's really important to have an idea of the personality, especially with dogs. Are we talking about a shy, skittish dog or are we talking about a wiggly butt dog that is happy all the time? And then taking precautions and educating the owner at that point not waiting until after the fact, um, but really having these conversations when we're talking about being hired for the pet sitting to begin with. Uh, whether it's pet sitting, dog walking, boarding, grooming, all of that is the same to really have a good idea of, of what the dog or cat is going to need to be safe. And sometimes that, in my opinion, is requiring the pet owner to take a few preventative steps that I just would not, I would not be, you know, accept a, a, a dog or cat or a house visit or dog walking without. And I'll tell you my number one preventative tip and my number two preventative tip. <laughs> so first of all, if I'm pet sitting the pet has to have ID tags on, especially a dog. Now, I know this is controversial because people are concerned about the caller getting caught up on something, which I 100% understand and agree with. But now there are so many products out there that are flexible, that stretch, that are even made of, of paper like tab bands that are like a hospital bracelet, you have to have ID, ID on the missing, on the pet in case they go missing. And that's the number one thing that gets a pet home if they go missing. Mm. The second thing is GPS, especially for shy, skittish pets. It, it's it To me, it's a deal breaker to the point where if I have a pet in my care that is feral, semi-feral, under-socialized, uh, shy, skittish, rescue, uh, rescued from a puppy mill situation. I literally have my own GPS that I put on the dog while it's in my care because I know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and trying to find a lost pet is like finding a needle in a haystack where the needle is moving and it can cost the pet its life. So for me, I have my own pet GPS. I keep it on one of my pets. And then if I have a, a pet in my care, then I put it on that pet. Or I would require a pet owner to do it. Uh, what are your opinions of things like air tags from Apple? Because I know I, I know if you've used those before or have experience with those, because I, I, those are really popular. I see a lot of pets with them. But from your perspective, if that pet were to get out, is that a helpful thing to have? Absolutely. Anything is going to increase your likelihood of recovery. And also because of Murphy's law, increase the likelihood the pet won't go missing in the first place. I know we have taken care of pets who have gone, if this were to get away, there's no way I'm getting them back. We've all had that gut instinct. And so sometimes that may mean, uh, you know, if you're letting them into the backyard, keeping them on a leash. I will say is making sure that the harness and collar and everything is, is well secured. And, but like keeping them tethered to you may also be an additional option if you're in the backyard, because all things can happen in the backyard. The lawnmowers forgot to do it and you didn't look over there fully or, or a, I was at a house literally yesterday where three panels in the back fence had fallen down. So I had to go out and hammer those back in before I got the dog out, but just going do something to recognize, okay, this dog is telling me something. We don't have a connection. We don't have a bond yet. So what are the, the barriers, things that I can put into place before we get there? And that, that is on us. And that, that takes having that conversation with that client in, the pet history, I'm, I, you know, uh, Annalisa, I'm going to say is, is so critical of just how long have you had this pet? Where did you get this pet from? Those two things are going to tell you a lot about is this pet familiar with this with this location? Um, do are they have a history of or struggles with this pet that can come from that further conversation? And just talking with the owner about that can really help set you up for success. One hundred percent. It's so very, very important to get that feedback and insight from the pet owner. And if it is not a match for you, turn down the work. 
which is really which is which is hard but we have to be honest with ourselves of going i i tend to look at these and review sit and review all the information never commit to anything at any point in time wait to review all that information and then say am i set up for success with this with this visit am i am i going to be successful is the pet going to be successful in this situation as it currently exists if no are there things we can put in place or the things we can do, or do I need more information? You know, you, you also mentioned about the moving thing. We get so many people who are brand new to an area who need our services. Well, there's some additional questions. So what, what should we ask? What, what are some things that we should ask or poke or pry about when somebody goes, yeah, I just moved in yesterday. I need you to start walking my dog. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the most important is the pet's prior experience. And here's an insightful question. Has your pet ever gone missing before? That is huge Mm. because if they disclose to you, my pet, oh yeah, my pet went missing two or three times. My pet got out all the time at my last house. My pet is an escape artist, Uh, you know, those sorts of things. And then you ask, and how did you find your pet? Well, my pet came back to me right away. Or my pet was found three miles away by going up to somebody's back puppy dog door, whatever it is, that will give you a big insight into the uh, flight risk possibility. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Dan from NYC Pooch has this to say. Time to Pet has been a total game changer for us. It's helped us streamline many aspects of our operation, from scheduling and communication to billing and customer management. Uh, we actually tested other pet sitting softwares in the past, but these other solutions were clunky and riddled with problems. Everything in Time to Pet has been so well thought out. It's intuitive, feature rich, and it's always improving. If you're looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confession. Because then that helps you understand what to do. And I think some of those follow-up questions are really important. And to know, it's not just, okay, have they gone missing? And I love how you brought that up of going, how did you get them back? Because that is equally as important if they say they have gotten away before. To say, you know, you may even say, what happened when they got away? How did you get them back? How long were they gone? Like some of these questions are just going to help set expectations and help you understand what you're getting into. And, And because... Some clients, I will say, may say, oh, no, they don't They don't get out that much. Okay, well, you said that much. You said that phrase. Tell me about that. What does that mean? Be actively listening when you're having this conversation with the client. Great point. And one thing I want to add on this is ask them how the pet got away or got missing because a lot of people will say, my dog backed out of its collar. My dog backed out of its harness. And these are red flags because most people, unfortunately, do not learn their lesson about having correct equipment that fits properly. So that is a red flag that you need to bring your own equipment. You need to double check theirs, ask them to show you how they put it on and off, maybe even do a double leash if you're doing a walk situation where you have the harness with the leash and then a slip lead around the neck as an emergency backup, but you have that loose. So you might need to have a backup method. Well, so honestly, let's say we go, come in and we have some clients who their dog uh, is we're going to do over a holiday. It was over 4th of July. Uh, just basically, what are things that we can do to prepare to make sure that that dog um, doesn't doesn't get out during those times with the fireworks are going off? That's a really excellent question. I think I'm going to go back to preparation is key. So finding out from the pet owner, are they sound reactive to fireworks? How have they responded before? What's their comfort zone? Where do they want to be when there's fireworks? And I think one of the best things is noise obstruction, sound machines, putting the radio on, TV on. Those sorts of things seem to, in my experience, work the best. So asking those questions And if the pet owner isn't sure, having them try some different things beforehand so that you have a strategy and a plan of action. Ideal is that they have a person with them during the fireworks. So that's a possible addition to services if it's available. 
I'll also add if you typically are doing walks around dusk to change that change that service. Yes. Don't don't be outside when you're walking, but that takes you thinking ahead for that day going, "Oh, it's July 4th. Guess when I'm not going to be out in the middle of the neighborhood walking this dog." Out walking the dog. Also, the days leading up to 4th of July and the days after and the same with New Year's. Mm. It's not just the day of, so you really do need to change it. And there's also some areas that have fireworks on a regular basis. For example, San Diego has fireworks on a daily basis. Other places do where there's amusement parks, special events, uh, community events, weddings, those sorts of things. So you need to adjust and have that in mind also. Yeah. Or, you know, if you live nearby a, a big city and they've got an NFL t- football team and they're doing really well or, you know, the baseball playoffs or whatever, they're doing really well. You expect those. And that takes us looking and planning ahead. Then I'll also add that even if the dog or cat doesn't have a history of it, adding the sound barriers, adding the white noise, adding these things does no harm. Right. These are additional benefits and, and are going to help set that pet up for success because all it takes is one time to trigger this and, and one bad experience to, to last a lifetime. Exactly. And that's really important for people to acknowledge and keep in mind is that pet owners and pet service providers are lulled into a false sense of security because something negative hasn't happened. Yeah. And it's actually the reverse is true. If something negative hasn't happened, statistically, it's going to happen. <laughs> so you want to be very aggressive in your preventative techniques and methods and actions and not count on, well, it's never happened before to predict that it will never happen in the future. Yeah. And how many times have we had clients who'd say, well, I don't know why you're doing that. We haven't had a problem before. And you just simply respond with, I understand that, but this prevention is in place to protect your dog or your cat or your home. And it's what we is is how we want to move forward with this. And that's really, I mean, you can provide them more stuff, but from a business perspective of going, I understand this is what we believe to be best practices. And it's something like we get it a lot for people who have a cat and they only want us to come by every other day or every third day and having to explain, no, we won't do that. We need eyes, hands, ears on the cat, on the home, minimum once a day, preferably twice a day at best. Um, And just explain to them to that about the importance of that. And then adding on top of that, the the escape artists and things like that to go, we, we really need to stay on top of this. Exactly. Prevention is key. Talking a little bit about about educating the the clients. And you had even mentioned earlier, like during this onboarding process, there may be things we need to talk to the clients about. How how do we approach clients with this, with educating them in an appropriate manner without really, you know, doom scaring them? Or, or maybe do we need to be doing that more, I guess? <laughs> well, I think a reality check is really good if somebody has a shy, skittish pet, recently adopted or rescued puppy mill, all those types of, of animals. I don't mind it being the reality check about that because we're talking about the pet safety and their life, because it is really a life or death situation. If you have a puppy mill dog that gets out in Chicago and is running up and down the streets, it's, it's really, the odds are not in your favor at that point. So I think you have to weigh the scenario and the risks as best as you can And if there are substantial possible risks, be more assertive in your communication and more clear with your boundaries. And then if you have a wiggly butt golden retriever that the family has had since it was a puppy and they they gun trained it, they go hunting, the dog isn't even reactive to guns or whatever, okay, then you aren't as um, fastidious with reviewing procedures and asking these very intense questions. And I think informing clients why you're doing it, say, well, it's a concern because we want your dog to be safe. And we know you recently rescued this dog or you recently moved to the area and your dog's gotten away before. So we just want to cover our bases and be as thorough as possible. 
I think that's really important. And at the end of the day, you want to work for clients who are amazing, understanding, and appreciate how much you care for their pet. So I think that's the biggest priority. Yeah, ex- explaining those reasons is huge. I know on, one of, on our intake form, we even have a question of like, for like the house of like, where's your electrical box and where's your water shut off? Like people will look at you and go, why? It's like uh, floods happen, right? Like, excuse me, like, do you want to, we, we need to be able to shut off the flooding toilet. Like explain why this is coming up. Same thing with this going, oh, you just moved to the area. You have a newly adopted pup and you need to travel over the 4th of July. Okay. We here are some additional questions that we need to walk through to see if this is even feasible for us and how we're going to make this work. Because I don't want your pet to get out during this because this is a high flight risk. And just being honest with them about that. And, you know, it's hard sometimes for pet parents to see that going, oh, no, they're great. They're perfect. See, they're happy and healthy here going. Yeah, but you've never experienced this with this dog. This is your first time going through this. So let's set each other up for success so that we don't have to worry about this stuff on the back end. And keep in mind, if you're providing a service, there is a possible liability to you at the end of the day. Talk a little about some other, some preventative things about having the ID tags, having those GPS trackers. And I did want to add about the ID tags. If your client hasn't had them on, you as a pet sitter can make some of your own that include... I'm with a pet sitter with your contact, with your name and contact information on it. And just have those in your car, have those in your go bag so that when you arrive, you can put those on the dog if the client forgot to do that. I absolutely love that. And I, I you can actually get them pre-printed disposable ones. We have actually had veterinary clinics that utilize pre-printed paper, plastic, they're like ID bands or, you know, festival wristbands or hospital wristbands. They have them pre-printed with their hospital, the veterinary clinic name and phone number. Upon intake, they put that on the pet. When the pet checks out, they leave them on the pet. They've actually helped recover people's pets because they left the paper ID tag uh you know, band on the pet when it went home. So you actually could be doing the pet and the family member a a service. Yeah, exactly. And those don't cost too much. There is a cost to them, but they don't cost an exorbitant amount of money. And, you know, they're, they're very reasonable at that. Absolutely. The last time I checked for like 200 uh, unprinted ones. So you'd write your phone number on it. It was like $20. Oh, Oh, well, that's okay. Well, I know what I'm adding to my Amazon list. Hold on. Um, <laughs> but other other than, you know, us having GPS trackers, making sure ID tags on there, how else can we help pet parents prevent this? What should they, how could they prepare before they even leave to for on their trip? One of the biggest tips I have is to put locks on the gates. The number one way that pets get out in the bed from the backyard is that someone leaves the gate open or kids playing in the neighborhood, open the gate or the dog jumps up and this one time hits the latch and is able to open it. So when the pet owner is, I mean, I think they should have locks on the gates or at least a carabiner that keeps it from popping open. If they, when they're, when they go on vacation or for travel, they absolutely should have locks on the gates and cancel all yard services. No landscaping, no pool maintenance, nothing like that, especially of course for a pet that has access to the backyard. You just don't want to risk someone else coming and going or opening the back gate without you knowing as a pet sitter. So those are some easy tips. And it might not even be somebody. It could be the wind or, yes. you know, or you have a storm come in and it just shifts it just enough. And so they've already they've canceled their yard services or they don't have yard services. And yet the gate still swings open. So that that's a great preventive measure. So another thing that we can have on our hand of just some cheap little carabiners to slap on those. If we're in the when we're when, when we are in the yard doing the walk inspection and clipping yes. those through. Exactly. We've talked a lot about prevention, education, and some common ways and reasons why pets escape. Let's let's dive into the you know the worst case happens and they and they do get out. You know, what what are some of the immediate steps that we need to take? The number one most important step that can be very uncomfortable 
to hear and to do for a pet service provider is to notify the pet owner immediately. We have a natural response when the pet goes missing to think, let me look for it, I can find it, but really you probably won't. So my rule of thumb for my own pets with my pet sitters, with my dog walkers, is you have 15 minutes. If you can't locate my missing pet in 15 minutes, you need to call me and notify me right away. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Why not take a couple hours and look? Because maybe you can find the dog. Maybe it's down at the park or in the neighbor's yard. Well, the first thing is that's not your decision to make. The decision is the pet owner's to make. If you call the pet owner and say, I've, the dog darted out the front door as I was coming in, I went up and down the street, it's been 15 minutes, and I can't locate your dog, what do you want me to do, or can you return home, the, ask that question, and they say, oh, I'm not worried about it you know, go around the block a couple times. Let me call my cousin Susie. She'll come over and help, whatever it is. That's the pet owner's decision. That's not our decision. It's like trying to decide if a pet needs veterinary care when it's not a life-threatening thing. It's up to the pet owner to make that decision. The second thing is that the pet owner is more likely to be able to recover the pet than the pet sitter or the dog walker. So it's really important that they are empowered with the information so that they can come on site as soon as possible, if it's possible. Yeah, not 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 delaying. And that's a conversation that we need to have with the, the pet owners, too, right, of going, OK, uh, we, we, we think about this whenever there's an elderly pet and we go, what do you want us to do in case the worst case happens? Right. Well, let's have that conversation now. So that's out in the open. But like you mentioned, because we're lulled into this false sense of security, oh, I've had this dog for five years. I've have I've been pet sitting for 11 years. I've never had a pet escape. So why would I even bother asking? But having that conversation and making just part of your general intake when you're talking with them in their home, if the worst case were to happen, how would you like us to, ha- to handle that? And you can say, here's how, here's our procedures. Here's our process, how we would like to do this. What would you like to have happen? Is it 15 minutes? Is it immediate? Is it just don't even bother searching and call us as soon as they slip out? Because you need to make sure that you are both on the same page with that because you are in a partnership with this person to care for their pet. Exactly. And especially with cats, it's very critical to ask the question because we know kitty cats, indoor only kitty cats can be very good at hiding and you can come to a home visit and you might not see them. So asking the question of it, does your kitty cat hide a lot? How many visits does it need to be before I should be concerned that I'm not seeing the cat, that sort of thing, that would be really recommended. Now, let's say you know, we've we've it's been 15 minutes. We've made a phone call and the owner wants us to keep looking. W- walk us through the next you know, 12, 24, 48 hours. Kind of what's that process begin to look like for us? The process is very different searching for a dog versus a cat. Okay. Because the kitty cat more likely is hiding nearby and the dog can definitely get further away, even though many times they are found near home. So you need to take that into consideration. After you've notified the pet owner, you do have to initiate some emergency actions. So one thing is back to it's an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Having an idea of some strategies or a plan of action in advance and having that maybe print outline printed out and in your glove box or at your place of work so that you know these are the 10 things I'm going to do if a pet goes missing. So you're already on top of it. So for example, for a cat, You want to do a very careful physical search of the interior of the property and the exterior of the property because most cats are found very near home. I like to recommend that pet service providers have their business cards on them always so that if a cat goes missing, they can go to the immediate neighbors. We recommend three houses in each direction, knock on the door. 
explain the situation, make sure they know what the cat looks like, and then give them the business card so that they can reach out to you day or night and they have the contact information. That's an emergency action to take. For dogs, it's a little bit different because they can get a little bit further. We recommend having a few posters made up in advance. These can be ones that are laminated that you roll up and keep in your car or you keep them in the back of your storage closet, whatever it might be. But big signs, we're talking about poster size signs and to have them made in advance. You just use a black permanent marker, lost dog at the top with your phone number already written in at the bottom. And then if a pet goes missing, you take the black marker and in the middle, Write a brief description, black lab, uh, Dalmatian, whatever it might be. You write that in the middle. And those would go up at the ends of the street where the pet got away from and at the closest busy intersection. That's the emergency action so that you get possible sightings. Or if the dog goes up to someone, they see a big advertising sign and are able to reach out to you. Please note that different municipalities have different laws about signs, so you do want to be on the safe side about that. A good tip is if you see some yard sale signs up and about, you're probably safe in that area to put up a sign. And after you get the pet back, please do go and remove them so that they're not a visual disturbance uh, and messy in the community. Yeah, because the last thing you want to do is have the sign out there that's meant to help and it gets take, taken down by code enforcement in the area or an angry neighbor. Exactly, exactly. Now, there are some other really important protocol items I wanted to go over about cats specifically, um, but some of them, there's an overlap with dogs also. So one thing is to preserve a scent article, especially if there's multiple pets in the household, because if you do or the client ends up bringing out search dogs, you want to have a good scent article. So this can be toys, collar, bedding. You just want to pick that item up and put it away from the other pets. You could, let's say it's a toy, put it in a Ziploc bag and put it up in a cupboard, someplace cool and away from the other pets. Don't put it in a hot car. Don't wash it. Don't do anything along those lines. Do not smoke around your scent articles also. One other thing is to be prepared for sightings. So make sure if this is the interim between when the pet goes missing and the pet parent comes home, if you get a sighting, you need to get as much information as possible. So the scenario is you're, the cat went missing, you go outside to the neighbor's house, you knock, oh my gosh, yeah, I saw Fluffy in the backyard. You want to write down the person's name, the address, the time, the date, and hopefully get their phone number so that if the pet owner needs to reach out to them, they have a way to do that. We talked a little bit about the signs. The signs are really critical. Another place you can post a sign is actually in the front yard of where the pet went missing, but that requires a little more supplies like a wooden stake and that sort of thing, but that really can be critical. We have gone on so many searches where even the next door neighbor did not know that the pet went missing at all. Mm. So we went over physically searching the inside and the outside of the property. We went over talking to the neighbors in three houses in each direction. And if possible, for cats, you want to personally search those properties. Please do not leave it up to the neighbor to check the property because it's such a high probability that the missing cat is there. You need to have your eyes in the backyard. Is there hiding places or is it just a concrete backyard where there's no place for the cat to hide? Is there a crawl space, a deck? those sorts of things. And one more insider tip about kitty cats going missing at all, but especially within 24, 48 hours, sometimes it's easier to find them at night 
because you can use a high powered spotlight and look for eye shine, the reflection of the cat's eyes. So let's say there's a deck on the neighbor's property and you really can't see that well during the day. Ask permission to come back at night with a flashlight. Yeah, that eye shine, because again, it's it's shaded. Sometimes those crawl spaces are really tiny, really small. Those decks are slammed right down on the ground, but there's one little tiny hole that they're able to skitter into. And so shining that light, I, I absolutely love that. And just doing, working through those scenarios. And I know one that comes up a lot is when we got, start talking about a lost or escaped pet, people start asking questions about trapping, right? Do I When do I bring out a trap? And then the other question of like, where do I even get a, a, a trap to try and get this cat back inside? So for the average uh, pet parent, I would say that's the time to bring in a professional or a volunteer who has extensive trapping experience because a pet absolutely can be hurt from a trap that is not monitored or set properly, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Now, if we're talking a pet service provider, there's amazing training online that different businesses offer and rescue groups and cat feral cat trapping organizations. I highly recommend taking that, making sure you know how to trap safely. For cats, the rule of thumb is if it's an indoor only cat that gets out, you want to get a trap out immediately. Because many times they are outside hiding nearby and luring them and getting them to go into a trap is the only way you're going to get them back home. Mm. Shy, skittish dogs, traps can be deployed, but usually you have to wait until they've calmed down. They're not just running blindly and frantically, and they've established an area where they're hanging out, and then you need to deploy a trap in those instances Those, depending on the size of the dog, can be quite large. So again, that's where you might need to work with a professional. Did you know that the National Association of Professional Pet Sitters, or NAPS, is the only national, nonprofit, professional pet sitting association dedicated to raising and abiding by industry standards? NAPS provides pet sitters with the tools and resources to own and operate successful pet sitting businesses. And their in-person conference is coming to Savannah, Georgia, March 1st through 5th, 2024, and it's called Bloom and Grow Your Business. Their goal is to bring together industry leaders with session topics that are idea-focused and on a wide range of topics to foster learning, inspiration, and provoke conversations that matter. If you attended the 2023 conference, you can enjoy a discounted rate through August 31st. And if you're listening to this episode right when it comes out, that's tomorrow. Otherwise, they have early bird registration through September 30th, and the registration October 1st through February 19th will be at the full price of $225. Visit the NAPS website at petsitters.org for information regarding the NAPS membership, certification, and complete conference details for their conference March 1st through 3rd in Savannah, Georgia. What are some best practices for getting that pet back in? I know we kind of mentioned trapping might be an option, but, you know, just going up and grabbing the pet or like, you know, with treats or kind of what's our next step at that point? It really comes down to the pet professional or the pet parent's past experience and knowledge with recovering their pet or any pet at all. So someone who isn't knowledgeable, isn't experienced, and is absolutely frantic and can't think straight, they probably should not be involved in trying to recover that pet or grab it because it's so likely that it can can have a bad outcome. So you need to assess the situation and decide what is the best course of action based on knowledge, experience, training, and the actual situation. Ideal is to get the pet safely confined in some way. So for dogs, this means getting them in the backyard and closing the gate to a fenced yard where then you know they're safely confined. For a cat it that snuck into somebody's garage, close the garage door, get them safely confined. So safe confinement is the number one best way to actually catch a pet. For dogs, I highly recommend researching and watching videos on calming signals. 
This is really important in recovering a dog and being able to actually capture them, but it's quite complex. And how to approach a dog or a cat, you never approach them straight on or like stalking them. You don't do that. You do from the shoulder approaching or make an arc around them so that you're not just straight on and you don't stare at them. So it can get quite complicated. So I would recommend doing some training on that. There's many tools that can be used, like a snappy snare or a catch pole with dogs or cats. But this is a lot of equipment that it's not realistic for most people to have on hand. It's expensive and takes up a lot of space or it can be. So but those are some things to consider and think about, at least. Yeah, and that that number one tip of getting them into a confined space somehow, leaving that door open, leaving that garage open, leaving that backyard door open somehow, and you know having it monitored, and that gets complicated if they have additional pets that you're still needing to care for, if they have additional things that you know they have to account for. I, I found a really good one is is um, you know if we have if we've been asked to help recover a lost dog. Again, depending on the dog and their history, and this is asking additional questions. If they love car rides and you spot that dog stopping your car, throwing open the door, a lot of times they'll jump in before they even realize what's going on. <laughs> it's true. It's true. One time I was uh, uh, driving in uh, C- Central California and there were two German shepherds running on the side of the road. And I just went, opened the car door and said, come on, get in. And they both just jumped in and they were on a busy, busy highway. So. Wow. Unfortunately, I had just gone grocery shopping and they decided to eat all of my groceries in the back of the car, but they didn't get hit. They were fine. <laughs> oh, it's a small sacrifice to make. Our RIP groceries, right? <laughs> well, and as we're talking about this, Annalisa, this kind of it's got me thinking a lot about just like um like emergency management of like is what what role should we be taking on during this and 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 i guess one of the important aspects of this is the effective transfer and communication of information and data so how do we get in that mindset of now i'm managing this and i need to be communicating well and quickly to people i think one of the first things is to think about this in advance as a pet service business owner You want to make a decision about what your policy is, and that has to do more with availability, flexibility, and and being realistic about a situation than anything else. So, for example, deciding in advance, here's what my policy is going to be, and you don't have to disclose it. It's just what you know that you're going to do. I'm going to, I have a backup a pet sitter or dog walker who I will call immediately and have them take all of my clients for three days. And I will devote three days to looking for this pet. After three days, I transfer the search to the pet owner. But maybe it's not three days. Maybe it's a week. Maybe it's one day. Maybe it's an hour. I can't make that call for anybody else because let's say you're a single parent with a small child at home. You can't be out searching for a pet. Or let's say, on the other hand, you're semi-retired. You have a lot of free time. Then maybe it's going to be different based on your personal logistics. Think about it in advance and have that set out, you can always change your mind based on the new information you get. But let's say you decide with my example, three days, I'm going to turn all of my, I'm either canceling or I'm going to have a backup dog walker, pet sitter, take my cases for three days. And I'm going to be just searching for this pet full time. The important thing is to keep in touch with the pet owner and to document everything you're doing. And I like to ask the pet owner, is there anything else you would like me to do until you get here? So being clear about that. And I think using in your communication, the reality that the pet owner actually will be the primary point of contact and the primary person, nobody's going to search better than the pet owner for their own pet. Let's be realistic about that. They're the one who's bonded with the pet and that's the most important relationship and the most important advocate for that pet. 
And as you mentioned earlier, they're the one who's going to be making the ultimate decisions, right? And so while you can be collecting information, that needs to be funneled quickly and efficiently up to the owner so that they can know what to do with that. You can give advice, you can give recommendations, but at some point, you know, they may say, you know what? I, we just need to stop. Like I, we, I, I can't do this anymore. And and that I, that may be hard. That's hard to hear as a as a person, especially if they got out on your watch. But respecting that decision and you know still doing what you can to support them. One of the other things is you really want to write everything down. Don't think you're going to remember. There was a sighting of Fluffy on West Avenue with so much information coming in. You want to write it down and pass that on to the pet owner. One of the other things you can do is provide the pet owner with resources so that they can make the decisions about what course of action they want to take. So in advance, you can just do some internet research and search your area for pet detectives, humane trapping, rescue groups that help with trapping lost dogs. There's Facebook pages that cover the entire United States with a variety of resources. Some are free, some are fee-based, but you could, for your area, have a list and provide that to the pet owner when it's time for you to transition out or as possible resources that they can then reach out to for assistance. I'm I'm envisioning kind of a neat Google Doc with a lot of this up there. And then even then, you can give them one link to a Google Doc, and then that's where you're storing all of the information, all the photos, all the sightings, the checklist of things that you've done, instead of having to send them individual texts and go, I was here. I was here, just keeping it all in one place and keep it all really well managed. And what's the other important part about this? We're talking about prep ahead of time of going, especially those timelines. I think those are so critical. Do I search for 15 minutes? Do I search for three days? Taking the, my personal risk assessment of what I'm able to do, because that means that when that happens and your heart rate's elevated and your adrenaline's pumping and you're going through, you don't have to make those decisions. You just turn to your policy that's over here. You flip to page three and you start activating this. And like you said, going, okay, I may need to adapt and change as this happens, but at least I have something to turn to and I'm not having to make this up on the fly. You're exactly right about that because when that actually happens, everything in our brain is just scrambled. We're just on a immediate visceral response to the situation. And if we have a plan to fall back on, we don't have to think about it. It's so much more efficient. I know you've you've also talked a little bit about um and, and stuff that you do through through the pet detective and um pet search and rescue is is about equipping other people with this knowledge and with this experience. So if people are listening to this and they're going, well, how do I, how do I learn more about this? Or, or maybe is this something that I could offer to my community? They do that, they do that research and they go, oh, there's nobody here locally to do this. How, how would somebody get started in this? There's such a high demand across the entire United States and even around the world for a wide range of services and products that help people search for and find their lost pets. I highly encourage pet service business owners to consider adding services and options to their community because when a pet goes missing in many areas, there is no help. And that's why I started my business over 18 years ago is because my soulmate dog went missing. And in that moment, I realized there would be nobody to help me. So mm. if somebody wants to know, know more, there's a wide range of things from trapping to witness development to helping with flyers and posters. And uh, of course, search dogs, training search dogs to help sniff out lost pets or evidence. One of the best resources is Cat Albrecht, who I went through my training with, with Missing Animal Response, and that's her website, missinganimalresponse.com. She offers online training for how to be a pet detective, how to help people who have lost pets. Also, great free information and education and videos that she puts out there. And she also has special training where if you want to train a dog to help search for lost pets, you can actually go through her online training to see if that might be a match also. You specifically search with with rescue dogs to find lost pets. How, how, how big of a difference does that make? in the search process? 
many lost pets would never be found if it weren't for search dogs because they're using a, an ability that we can't even comprehend. Their sense of smell, their vision, their hearing is so far superior to ours in a searching capacity that they can find a pet that is is not visible. They can find evidence that would never be discovered. One of my search dogs, she found a tuft of fur the size of a penny on an 18-hole golf course that was from the missing pet. That's Whoa. just not possible if you're a human being and you're searching. That's amazing. And so there's are there particular kinds of dogs that would be better or or, or worse for that? I don't know how to, how to phrase that question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think... Having done this for so long, and I've probably trained, I don't know, 20 dogs for specifically search and rescue from uh, for lost pets from a wide variety of breeds and backgrounds and experiences. In my experience, it is amazing enrichment for almost any dog. And almost any dog can have a lot of fun learning how to use their nose to find query, to find their target, whether it's your other dog, whether it's your house kitty cat or the neighbor's turtle that, that got out of the pool and is wandering around the backyard, it's really fun for them. So the real question is what the pet parent or the business owner has as a goal, what they envision and what they do. And if that's a match for the dog they already have or a dog that they're planning on getting. But I support all dogs that the owner, if they want to do something fun with them, doing scent training, doing the lost pet scent training, even for senior dogs, they just really love to use their nose. And it's a lot of fun for them. And it's very rewarding for the owner or the handler because you work as a team with your dog and you communicate with your dog in such an amazing way where you're asking them. I'm giving you this scent or I'm giving you this cue. Please find this. Please match this or, or let me know if this is nearby. And to have your dog search and then find it and let you know where you know they just found this. It, it's like nothing else in the world. That sounds really magical. That sounds really cool. And especially have that bond and that relationship with that pet. Uh, Annalisa, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking about prevention and then in the worst case scenario, what some steps that we have to in our in our arsenal to get them back and the importance of communication and partnering with the pet owner and those in our community. This is a huge topic. I know we barely scratched the surface with, with a lot of this stuff. So if people want to learn more, get connected, follow along with your work and pick your brain, how best can they do that? Absolutely. And I want to add that I offer free consultations with people if they would like to train their dog to search for lost pets, whether it's for fun or a business. You can schedule a consultation with me where I will talk with you about your, your dog or getting a dog. I'll talk to you about your goals. I'll give you feedback and I'll tell you about all sorts of resources, whether it's in-person training, online training, because this is my number one thing I'm passionate about. It's amazing and I encourage people to do it. So please do reach out to me. I also offer free advice and feedback about lost pet cases. I want everybody to find their pet whether they hire my services or not. So I can provide my contact information. My website is petsearchandrescue.com. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram with that same petsearchandrescue.com. And I also give out my cell phone number because I want you to call me, I believe, 100% in giving people feedback. And even if I can't help trying to steer you in the right direction, so you can call or text me personally anytime, 310-880-8268. This is something I'm so passionate about. It's it's to part of who I am. I want to help you find your pet. And I want to encourage other people to help others find their pets too. Thank you so much for having me.
the realities are in the kind of businesses that we run that at some point a pet will get out and we have to be prepared for that event. Instead of laying awake at night stressing about it and worrying about it, we should direct that energy into doing something, into the planning, having the forms ready, having those ID tags ready, having your communication plan ready, and the network that you're going to reach out to already in place so that you can sleep better and that you truly can give that peace of mind to your clients. We want to thank today's sponsors, Time to Pet, and the National Association of Professional Pet Setters for making today's show possible. And thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and we'll be back again soon.